API Resilience Podcast. It's our belief that APIs are central in the changing business landscape that has been named digital transformation, and that digital transformation through APIs offers the opportunity for a dramatic shift in how companies can work together and participate in creating value. We've invited guests from many different types of organizations and asked them to share insights from their journeys and their API programs, as well as the challenges, objectives, and approaches as they endeavor to make their companies and communities more resilient. You're not buying a digital experience platform. You're not buying an API portal. You're actually adding it to your whole ecosystem as a useful key to reduce the time to build and value for your customers. You have to understand why, you have to understand the vision, and humans are still necessary to bring that message, but how it's being built should no longer be of any concern. Being a little different is also very challenging eh? because suddenly you're no longer able to compare yourself with others or for other customers. Like, who are you now? Welcome to the API Resilience Podcast. Today's guest is Nick Veenhoff. Nick is a longtime Drupal friend from the local Drupal community who I share a lot of community memories with. He's the CTO of DropSolid, a company that delivers digital experiences in Drupal. While DropSolid is not strictly in the API space, I really wanted to have a discussion with Nick to compare the digital experience world with the developer experience world and to look for similarities and differences between the two. Advanced warning, lots of ecosystem talk in this episode. We are even talking about speciation and rivers and mountains and stuff like that. We also ended up talking a bit about how both our businesses differentiated away from being Drupal generalists to specialist consultancies with both product and a service offering. So if you want to hear a little bit more about how that all happened and why we chose to go that route as a company, more about that also in this episode. So without further ado, here's our conversation. Okay, Hi, Nick. Hi, Christoph. Hi. So thank you for doing this, Nick. I would love to iron out something that I'm seeing. So you know that we've specialized into being a Duff portal shop. Yeah. And you've specialized in being... Um, we call it like accessible open digital experience platforms, which is a mouthful of the more uh, achievable solution for mid-markets if you compare it to the likes of Acquia or Qual, right. Adobe, Sidecar and those alternatives. So you're doing digital experience and we're doing developer experience. They're two very different things, but they're the two sides of the coin, I think. Because you're on the, um, this is the experience we own as an organization that we provide to our customers site. And we are on the, here's a bunch of capabilities and building blocks that you can use to build experiences for your customers' customers. And it's part of the same transformation, the same digital transformation that's happening but it's like two sides of the same coin. I think you're in the evolved version of the website space and we're in like this new space, which is starting from the API sites, but it is, I, th I think at some point it's gonna converge or probably these are gonna be two separate domains that will keep on existing, but where larger organizations have this tool set for building experiences next to the one experience that they own and support and maintain. Yeah, so I, I kind of agree and, and disagree. I think they're actually on the same side of the coin. Okay. Um, and maybe the other side of the coin is proprietary closed stuff, which you cannot change at all. Huh? The, um, in the past, you had build or buy. Yeah. And either you build it fully custom and you as an organization are fully on your own and you have to have a massive engineering capability, even though engineering could not be in your core business. Uh, yeah. Imagine you're a Walmart or even Amazon in the past. Uh, they had to build because they couldn't buy um, because they were restricted in their own processes for this stuff. For Amazon, this turned out great. For Walmart, I think, yeah, maybe they made some different choices and that's why they're not Amazon right now. But that's uh, the past. Yeah? If we look at tenders today that come in in, in Drop Solids, actually they ask us for what can we have out of the box what can we configure? What mm -hmm. do we have to build custom? And what should we buy separately? Now, I think if you take those three, which is uh, out of the box, configure and build, 
that uh, the API portal that you're talking about is actually part of the, the build phase, as in where configuration and out of the box might not be possible. And it's actually part of that same digital experience platform that a company is building to make these customer journeys because you have the website, there's marketing automation, maybe there's customer data platform. There could also be an API documentation portal because it could be necessary to build specific journeys that otherwise are not configurable or available out of the box, but they still have to be accommodated for, if that makes sense. I, it makes sense. And I agree that we are similar providers. So we also do, we call it DevPortal as a service, which is you can start just with a SaaS-like experience, but which is customized to your needs and then maintained by us. So, you know, you don't have to own it if you don't want to, but you can own it whenever you want to. So that's the same that we're doing. I think uh, that's the open source part, but our positioning is very different. Yeah, on a meta level, it's another user journey. It's well, like it's, a, just, um, it's a building block to make user journeys where the, the solution could be that you have to build to, to get where you want it, or you could go into like the, these integration portals where uh, you link APIs to other APIs and suddenly it becomes this low code kind of environment. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful not to be throwing with all these buzzwords at the same time, mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly possible if you look at Zapier or Workato or, or like there's other alternatives and where you couple A to B and you just know these are the documentations of the APIs and I somehow have to mix it up. Yeah, then suddenly you're no longer in the build phase, but you're actually in the configuration phase. Mm -hmm. And and this gets really interesting um, because the, the more you can shift in towards out of the box, the faster you can actually create these customer journeys for your end customers. Yes. And it could be that, and, and that's also something I prepared when I look at the questions, mm -hmm. there's a very, very big distinction between product businesses, which have to have these API portals to accommodate their business model, or service businesses that could have and maybe should have an API portal to accommodate the time or at least to reduce the time to build these customer journeys for their business models. Yes. Um, and I think those two are like big challenges and not only for the API portals, but also for the businesses that DropSolid is in. You're not buying a digital experience platform. You're not buying an API portal. You're actually adding it to your whole ecosystem as a useful key cornerstone to reduce the time to build and value for your customers. Um, yes. Which is very, very meta. And even if you can go more meta, uh, I was like thinking a bit too hard on, on this topic. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that stops us is the same for every human being is time. Uh, so if you compare uh, yourself with, uh, with me, the, state, the one thing that we have really, really equal is time. So if you could reduce the amount of effort to get to certain endpoints or to get to a certain customer journey in whatever likes that could be, uh, and you're in that build or configure phase, and that API portal is available to you, yeah, perfect. You saved yourself time, and you're faster than your competition. Yes. It's exactly the same with marketing automation. It's exactly the same with personalization and, and all these other components in that digital toolbox that a company could slash should have dependent on the maturity that they're at. And that's true. But I see digital experience or the digital experience space, I see as a, it's an extension of the old way of doing. In a very meta way, you're doing like, you can do digital experience with your APIs also, and your APIs are products and so on. In a very meta way, you can do the same tool chain for that also. But there's a shift happening, I think. When you're doing digital transformation, there's two things, two key objectives I see. One is uh, digital proximity, which is about bringing your product closer to the customer through digital interfaces so that they can self-service and they can just go online, use your app, use your website or whatever, and just get your product. And it's a journey that you built from end to end and that you can control as an organization. And I think that's the market of digital experience. We are in a market of that to some extent, because we have that also with APIs. Um, but another really important part of this market or of the transformation that's happening is a transformation towards complex adaptive organizations and ecosystems. And that means the, the world is getting more and more complex. We have so much more interconnection. We've got more interdependence. It's like crazy 
that, you know, you touch one thing and the whole thing changes. And the only way you can deal with that as an organization is to also become complex adaptive. And to become complex adaptive, you need another way of being on the inside. You need this, just the way that's ant nest work with like groups or, or like multicellular life. Like you have a, an emergent structure of how, how it is built up, like with organs and, and so on. Uh, with a separation of, of um, information, well, I'm going too deep in the weeds. Let's just say. Well, that's your background as well. Yeah, as a yeah, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I, I was going to say, we call this uh, uh, also the uh, uh, API philosophy uh, podcast. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, what I think what we're doing is we are enabling organizations to change the way they work on the inside so that instead of having hierarchical control to set clear goals for everybody, where you need to like a 10 year plan to get anything done, you get a much more adaptive organization where you are providing capabilities and you let the people that are in touch with the markets to set the agenda so that they are, they can adapt to whatever is happening in their local markets based on the capabilities that they have. And then the second part of that is that you also provide those capabilities to your ecosystems so that uh, people that are not even employed by you can be part of your adaptability. And that is the part that I think APIs are essential for. Uh, so I see these two big shifts that are happening. Um, and one is the part that you control and the other one is the part where you have less control but more power, I think. So I, I wanted to talk about it because I think I, I see what you guys are doing, like you're doing really, really well, I think. And like you're growing like crazy. You have a lot of success in the markets with, with solutions that you're providing and you're accessing it from that other angle. And we're coming from the API angle and, and we're just wondering where will it converge? How will they connect with each other? And it's a good question. Eh? So um, when you look at a small or smaller scale company that indeed makes websites, eh, then this is a very abstract idea because you're making projects yeah. Yeah. and the project starts, the project finishes and it's on to the next, which is a very, very energy draining operation. It's for the agency, it's very energy draining, for the customer it's very energy draining because there's nothing of societal impact or um, reuse impact that is embedded in that project. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at where most of us and in this podcast actually came from is that open source world. And what's the, the whole philosophy behind that open source world is to share. Now, what's the benefit of sharing is that you can reuse it and actually combine all that energy into these building blocks and actually get faster. Right? That's the same thing that can happen with APIs if you do the same in your organization. Most of what you're saying is really valid for medium to larger or, or massive organizations, mm -hmm. eh? mainly for governments, for example. This is like very, very crucial. And we actually made an exercise for a company that we work for. And they had the question, how can we reuse more of the 10 projects that actually are ongoing in our digital transformation? And that sounds like a buzzword, but basically there are like 10 websites, uh, but all of them have to connect to their single sign-on. All of them have to connect mm -hmm. to uh, SAP. All of them have to connect to whatever X other technology. You could look at it from custom code uh, where you share just you know where this is, that's documentation. You could look at it from a module perspective and the Drupal modules that maybe you can share and you make them generic. You could look at them from, okay, we have this connector and then we make an API of a middleware and, of, and we document that part um, and we kind of maintain that from that angle because also we support other technologies outside of Drupal to do that same thing. And that's all within the organization. Now, there's actually another level on top of that and that's to go outwards facing uh, with that same modular code base. It could be with the code, it could also be with the API, as you mentioned, is to go to the public, to open source that stuff or to open document your API. But ultimately it's the same philosophy. Um, and if you can do that, you actually struggle to your way through that reuse challenge. And if you're not even successfully maintaining it, even if your organization only has like 10 projects, you might be successful in maintaining it on, on a longer period of time and reducing friction and actually, again, increasing the speed of 
delivery. But I think in core essence, what Dropsology is doing is uh, very, very similar to what an API portal could do for organization if they're actually within that build phase. And either they do internal builds or they have outwards facing builders connecting to their company. In terms of a digital experience platform, it's exactly the same. Eh? We, we allow marketeers, but also internal developers to build these customer journeys. But ultimately, you have the crossroad of the build phase where you have to have documentation. And like for example, in this customer case, or, or even with another customer, which is called Sudal, they're also in the cases of our, our website, they connect with all these different um, internal tools and it, it's, it's like a massive interconnected web. You have to document all of these APIs somewhere in a generic place, even though maybe externally facing, nobody ever will be able to access that documentation. But it's your first step towards outwards facing documentation if your vision is to get into that interconnected world, as you mentioned. And where everything is somewhat organic and you don't know how someone will interact yet with your brand, then being API first is important, allowing obviously the very obvious case and the website case to, to work using that as the first uh, example is great. Um, but it's those building blocks, it's that foundations, it's that vision that's really important. And then I think we really are on the same side of the coin. Mm. I, I think that basically, well, we're building different interfaces that are at different abstraction levels. So you're building human interfaces for the most part, I think, uh, where it's people that are going to be using those interfaces. And we are building an interface for the interface builders and the, the computer interface integrators. Yeah, it's, it's like one abstraction level higher. Also, we work mostly with really large companies. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is really a, like an, an organic problem that situates if your company or your organization is as large where you can no longer connect with everybody on a human scale. Yep. Um, and you suddenly see that popping up and then that problem like, it becomes really, really prominent. I have a theory that this shift from a human in the middle as like the default way of communicating, that this is everywhere that this is going to happen. How do you organize stuff? How do you get a lot of people to do stuff? Basically, you have a group of people, you put a boss on top of them. That boss talks to their boss, who talks to their boss, who talks to their boss. And then like they somehow coordinate together and make stuff happen. But basically, you have a team that communicates with a person, that communicates to another person, and so on. And I think I've got a theory that we're shifting towards a model where you have teams that are communicating with teams through interfaces rather than through bosses. And that's this other way of collaboration. Like if we can free up a lot of the people that are currently just transferring messages, like being a manager is a lot more than transferring messages, but there's no, a really no, but big I part you're saying, uh, so, And I think you can also see it in, in uh, the evolution of, of what people like or dislike. Um, certainly people that are, are building things dislike talking over and over again about what they're going to build. Um, like um, you have to understand why, you have to understand the vision and humans are still necessary to bring that message, but how it's being built um, should no longer be of any concern. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to have governance, uh, you have to have um, your APIs, and then suddenly also concepts like, and, and we see that mainly in these bigger organizations, and um, it's these like API gateways and, and all those things. I used to think about uh, who needs this API gateway thing and, and who wants to add another layer in between for, for what? But actually building an organization on a technical level is not that different, I think, from building out a new country um, with a new government and you need to figure out all the rule sets on, on how to make everyone behave as good as possible uh, within certain boundaries, within the limits, uh, within the cost perspective. It's, it's all about this governance and then APIs and documentation, all of those things are really, really great to make sure that everyone is empowered as possible, but stays within those constraints. It's more than that. So that's a really big one, like governance and making sure that you control who has access to what and, and stuff like that. Another really big one is developer experience. If you work with a gateway that uses proxies, you can rewrite the query 
you can create a contract from scratch. And in the background, it might still be, you know, the old, very reliable stuff that's still doing its job. But on the front end, it has become something that's much easier to use. And then the backend can start evolving independently of whatever is consuming the backend. And that's, that's a really huge one because it starts decoupling your organization and makes you more, more agile and more adaptive also. Yeah. Right, but that concept isn't new. Eh? I mean, mi middleware yeah, yeah, sure. technology exists for, for ages, yeah. Um, yeah. sometimes in the good way, sometimes in, in the bad way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but indeed, like suddenly it's it's more loosely coupled in, in a way. It's not from the same programming stack. It's not from the, the same desk where it all originates from. It's on the web. And that's a massive <laughs> shift. It doesn't matter what's going on behind the scenes. Like you can you can start evolving, you can start creating business value without actually changing much of your underlying stack, which is kind of no. crazy, actually. I've heard stories of organizations where they got um, like an internal capability that they needed because of their organization. And then they're talking with other people outside and they're like, oh, you're, you're able to validate identity? That would be fantastic if we could use that for our business. Can you somehow sell this to me? Can you sell me an identity uh, validation service? And then like, if you, if you don't have a gateway, it's, that's a lot harder. Yeah. So then, then, yeah, almost all our customers have gateways. So it's, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, a and we see it in, in some organizations, um, but if we interact with governments, this is like uncharted territory. Because I don't know why, why that, that could be, but yeah, putting in that such a government because of all those departments and then putting that technology stack as a general thing in, in front of that, that's tricky. But okay, uh, that's the it's challenge true. of today. And I, I, I do see the, the added value. The, the other thing that is interesting in terms of that API gateway part, um, mm -hmm. and maybe also on API portals, and, and it's something where we really focus on right now, is the, the whole data sovereignty part. Mm. Uh, so we actually filed for a grant to focus a lot more on, on that data, like data sovereignty part. Like, and then I'll, I'll ask the question back to you. Eh? Um, but um, we, we won tenders or we have really great conversations um, because the, the software that we are able to deploy or able to whatever deliver and the data as well are actually from that customer. Mm -hmm. If you look at integration hubs like Zapier or, or others, suddenly it's actually in the SaaS service um, and mm -hmm. you no longer have control about that data. It's the same with API gateways. Eh? So either you build or buy and then buy, you can choose to deploy locally or SaaS, but actually the, the movement is into SaaS, but it's really counterintuitive against uh, do I really have control about my data? Yeah. Um, and how do I solve that part where I do want to start really quickly and gain time? It's like, again about time constraints. Eh? But I don't want to, at some point, be relying on a US government that is able to look into my data because they have this new data governance act that's somewhere, anywhere in the world, so they can actually look into uh, anything that is from a US company. This is a very, very tricky field. And, and it really will, I think, will, will change again how software is being deployed and, and serviced, uh, and not only software, but also data um, and the whole SaaS model around it. It's a massive thing that we're seeing right now, and, and governments are really concerned. Uh, and I think if governments are concerned at some point, organizations will become concerned. So then the question, I guess, back to you is like, how do you see that evolving? from a product point of view, but also from that API gateway and, and those SaaS services. Mm, for us, this is really important. The ability to be in different clouds, depending on customer needs, the ability to be in different countries, depending on customer needs, those are all essential for a lot of our customers. But it's kind of weird because there's this apparent contradiction between reuse and customizability this is also the thing we are on that edge like we have mm -hmm. a product that is like basically it's a development platform that accelerates our delivery we have a productized set of services that allows us to quickly deliver something but then we can extend as much as you want and still we're delivering it kind of like SaaS because you don't have to own it or maintain it until you want to but then customers are often very confused because they come to us like, so are you a product company or a service company? And then it's like, 
well, we're kind of both. And they're like, ah. <laughs> so do you also have that with customers? Yeah, very much. Uh, and I think that's the tricky space where, where both of us are in. We could draw a hard line and say it's only SaaS and we decide where you're hosted and either you're happy or not happy and then we don't want you as a customer. But that that's totally not what we're embracing. Uh, we, we really yes. embrace this, this ownership, the, the fact that you can go away at any time um, like the, the, the open source core values as, as we know it, but then on a customer level, and we do see certain companies value that more than others. And then for those that don't care, sure, you can do the productized way if mm -hmm. they don't really care. Um, well, they also do care, but should be contractual. For others, it's really, really important and it's a deal breaker. Yeah? So for example, yeah. we have one or like are, are nearing uh, the end of a certain deal phase where uh, even Acquia was uh, not chosen, um, also not Oracle, not Sitecore, not any of those, because not the, the whole thing was not able to be on-premise. Um, and uh, yes. just looking from, from the fact that it's no longer a CMS, uh, you have yes. obviously the CMS, there's a marketing automation, then there's a CDP, it needs to be interconnected and work in their own data center and go through their own VPNs and then collaborate with, it becomes a very complex story. And in the end, the one that, that pays for it, uh, the, the product owner or the project owner on the customer side, they're actually wanting to buy an out-of-the-box solution. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. And, and, and that's a very, very frictionless journey. It's like, okay, yes, but no. And um, sure, um, but prepare. Uh, it's not going to be a walk in the park necessarily, yeah. but it will take all your boxes. Um, so we bump into that every single time. Like we've had customers, they came to us, uh, we, we need a developer portal, show the demo. And then they start asking like, oh, but it doesn't do all of this out of the box. Like you don't have like your product way that says how you need to use this. Like that's not what we want. We want a clean product. We want clear separation. We want a clean boundary. And we, in the worst case, we'll adapt to it. But we just want that clean boundary. And we were like, well, no, because we want to be committed to your success. We don't want to give you a product that's not going to do your job for you. We have this product so we can accelerate it, but we, we want to go the last mile and help you to be successful. And normally that's okay. And we can get that explained, but then some customers are just blocks, but now they came back. So it's, it's, um, yeah. And, and yeah. that's the, the, the extension of the build versus buy in the, the easy way is to buy. Yes. But then if you, uh, you have to accept that not everything will be according to your own business model, you will have to adapt as a business instead of that product that will have to adapt. It's a tricky exactly. balance. Uh, it, it's the who is going to adapt to what? Yeah. Like, are you going to adapt to the tool or is the tool going to adapt to you? I have a suspicion that for a big part, a lot of these products out there are actually not really fulfilling their functions. Like perfect example is uh, Confluence Wiki. Every single customer I go to, they're using Confluence. I've had one that actually liked it. <laughs> one well, single. We're, we're actually in the progress of of thinking about adopting uh, Confluence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying that but, it's bad, but the the, the thing is, yeah. what what happens is that um, it's an open market. Everybody can add content. Fantastic. So yeah. everybody starts adding content. Nobody's cleaning up. So you get this massive, expensive, whatever you want, bonanza that doesn't make any sense anymore after a little while. So the, the only organization that actually liked that experience, they had a team of Confluence gardeners that were doing nothing but cleaning up the mess, yeah. like constantly. That was their job. Don't you have the same with, with APIs? <sighs> That's a very good question. Probably. Are you building, you're documenting, but someone needs to garden those things. It's also an ever evolving thing. So like, okay, you can go into the fully automated API portal and that generates API docs and whatever, but sometimes it's a manual thing. Eh? True. Well, I think, I think at some level it has to be manual because you need someone to make sense of it all and to organize information into like toolboxes so that people can understand the mental model that they need to understand to be able to use it easier. There are some products that are in that magical sweet spot that just do everything right. But I think 
can you adapt to the tool or not? Who is going to adapt to whom? That is the key question. And if you're very flexible as an organization or very young, you can just take an existing tool and mold yourself around it. Like yeah. as an organization. So those are the exceptions there as, as the younger organization. Yes. yes, you can be very right. flexible. Uh, looking at those larger scale uh, organizations, yeah, they, they have a bunch of legacy that they have to carry around and, and drag across that, that buzzword of the transformation. But that's exactly what it is, eh? becoming a bit more flexible compared to the previous state. So I'm, I'm currently, I'm thinking about, so we live on Slack. That's our beating heart. That's how we, how we get things done for a big part. That and, and Google Calendar and and meetings but i've been thinking about like there's like this information overload problem because as you add more people to your organization there becomes more and more interconnections more and more noise if everybody has access to all the channels or if everybody's in a lot of the channels and you don't somehow clean up you get overload it's the same as with confluence it's the same problem it's information needs to be managed like you need garbage collection if you don't have garbage collection <laughs> it's going to explode so I've been thinking about, can you restructure the information architecture of, or the information system so that it creates good practices and that it, it helps to contain this information overload? <laughs> yeah, it, it becomes more a problem where you suddenly have, I think, 60 or 70 people is the, the scale where nobody can ever contact everybody in a timely fashion to make an, an, a, like an orderly decision. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. And then suddenly... You are in that space. Oh, we need processes. Uh, oh, we don't like processes, oh, but we do need them. How can we avoid becoming like slow? And then, sure, for the technical people, uh, technical documentation is great, and, and this governance part, the APIs, is, is great for yeah more marketing oriented uh, people having this out of the box experience to build these journeys is great because then suddenly they're independent. So adding these tools to the toolbox. Yes, indeed, uh, depending on, on what you do in that organization, uh, both of them have like a lot of value to stay flexible, even though you're a large organization sailing towards that same goal. I think it's the, can you create tools that just work for your organization? I think that is the key question. Well, I think the uh, question is, can you maintain them? I don't know, like yeah. we all created tools that work one day and then the next day they no longer work and they actually get into this pile True. of garbage that uh, we're never garbage collected. Uh, looking yes. at our own uh, GitLab or GitHub organization, reviewing what is out there. Well, most of that stuff is, is no longer in use and nobody really even knows like what's still the value. But it's so hard to delete something. Oh, that's a you problem. I'm, I'm fine in deleting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time with that. <laughs> yeah, I think if you as an organization, and, and it's the same in, in, in these APIs, right? it's the same in these digital customer journeys, learn to remove stuff. See if it breaks. If it doesn't, then you made the right call. That's the anti-fragile thing, right? Like, yeah, but it actually makes you less fragile. It makes you very robust if you're able to, to do this. Or even coming back to the Netflix era where in the past they had this chaos yeah. monkey, they did this with servers. But actually, if you're an organization at such a scale, you have to deploy this auto-breaking machine to just understand if your organization or our company is robust enough. Mm. Okay, I'm not suggesting that you should remove repositories at random, eh? but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then you get into all those weird things where then you go search for another NPM package and you get a backdoor <laughs> installed. Yeah. yeah. So the, the focus, I think, should be like, okay, it's fine. And in the last 10 years, we focus a lot on operations and making sure that everything is high available and all that, that stuff, which sometimes doesn't even make any sense. But that's another discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. But maintaining things, making sure that it's sustainable. Um, so that ultimately you actually gain time because you can focus on new things instead of somehow keeping that old car driving. I think that's the key to focus on for large organizations or medium organizations that want to stay in that digital business. And mm -hmm. then I think API portals are a great way of doing that. I think digital experience platforms that are sustainable eh, are a great way of doing that. And I somehow think that SaaS, software as a service, without opening up that box is not a sustainable way. It's like the KonMari of, of um, digital. Uh, does it give you joy? Um, yeah. and then, 
<laughs> if it doesn't give you joy, thank it and and move on. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Uh, because otherwise we'll be convoluted with random digital crap in, in a year or 10 and it's only getting worse. <laughs> Mm, I think that comes to another problem, which is traceability. Is like, sure, are you able? Yeah. If are you able to see discoverability, your... traceability, yeah. observability, like from a developer point of view, mm -hmm. like super important though, because it also saves you time. Because otherwise, like, who is going to dig into that backtrace and trying to understand what's going wrong? Mm -hmm. It's only going to get more complex. From Especially if, like yeah. in an interconnected system with with APIs, is like, yeah. you, you know, that one server that you think doesn't do anything might actually be essential. So, well, but that's a longer non-API resilience question. I think that for us, like we used to be a Drupal agency, an engineering company, and the key difference, what changed everything was when we started positioning ourselves and we changed what we were doing and we, we went into a different market. And I think it's similar also for Drop Solid, I think. Is that was was the positioning as a digital experience company? Was that the key to your success? Um, I think it was a necessity to execute the the vision that we have because if you just look at um, the point of view from um, a simplistic agency, if you, if you will, mm -hmm. um, then I think tools like Wix or, or any of those are good enough because. If you just need a simple website, most likely you don't have the vision that you want to go into that sustainable route and actually invest more towards a very different organizational cause. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for us, it was crucial. And also the, the split between a product company and a service company, even though we're still the same company, positioning ourselves on, on both angles yeah, was crucial mm -hmm. to actually be a little different. Being a little different is also very challenging eh? because suddenly you're no longer able to compare yourself with others or for other customers like who are you now so that's a challenge that we're still in trying to figure out how to do this from a point of view where i'm thinking on, on like when could drop solid be able to call in your help for example mm -hmm. is uh, from the product company point of view where we have uh, enterprise architects that actually go into these organizations and say, okay, how <laughs> can you now connect everything to everything? Uh, it's a bit like uh, the number 42. Uh, everything mm -hmm. is everything. Um, but making those architectures is one thing. It's documentation. But then ultimately finding out that there's no governments around APIs and no documentation around APIs it could be a key factor for the success of that company towards that digital transformation if they're buying into that vision, mm -hmm. then if they first installed this, an integration company like either ourselves or a partner from another country could come in and then do that project-based stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, those are very, very complex positionings that we're trying to figure out on how to get there. I think one of the big challenges, it, it sounds like you already have been doing some of this, is, is like helping to create a business case. So because... There are certain things, trends that we're seeing in the market that customers are not aware of yet. And then like when once they've identified like, yep, we want to work with you, how can we help to shape the project rather than to just do what they think that needs to be done? Uh, I think that's one of the big things that we're working on right now. Yeah, I think if I can recommend you one thing is to, to find these, these product companies or, or like large integrators become good friends with them because they will be the ones that can recommend you as a key stone into that journey of digital transformation because uh, the API portal is only one of them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, we, we do that. It's like we have partnerships. Yeah. But it's the same for us. So like we need to figure out how to get partners that um, have the same feeling about the product. But then on the other hand, we have the service agency that actually does this with our product because mm -hmm. service agency is our biggest customer yeah. from a product point of view. Yeah. And then the, the benefit I think that, that Drop Solid has is that offers or, or requests for proposals actually come in as I'm looking for a DXP mm -hmm. while they just see this from Gartner. Um, uh, yes. It's follow up of a CMS. They don't have a clue, eh? but yeah. it's in the request for proposal. Yeah. So the market is there and the customers are aware, but it took us three, four years. Three years ago, the, the term DXP was already on a website and then yeah. people declared us crazy. So. It really depends on where you are in that journey. 
yeah, truth be told, like we learned a lot from Acquia uh, in terms of positioning. Mm -hmm. um, even though they're closest to our business case, we don't fully follow what exactly they're doing, but they're actually really close. If you just look at Oracle yeah. or Sitecore or Oracle those B. bigger companies, mm -hmm. yeah, then yeah, screw them. Eh? Yeah. Um, like the, they're really, really on the other side of the game, in our opinion, obviously. Do you guys already talk with, with the analysts, like with Gardner and stuff? Yes, yeah, so we, we have uh, subscriptions uh, yeah. with Gartner. We did a vendor briefing and like, like the, the whole thing. Cool. We've been mentioned in seven reports now so far. Yeah, so we're also like on that journey. Yeah, I think another company that is, is very similar, like within the, the same vision is Open Social. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they also try yes. to go into the product space with all the challenges that come with that. Yeah, it's like finding the right balance between product and service and then explaining why that's the right way to do it. I think that the thing that I personally struggle a lot with is like, how much do you open back up to the community? Like we have a chunk of our work that we open source, but there's also a chunk that we don't. Uh, or like, you know, it's open source because it's the open source license. Obviously, our customers uh, can do what they want. But it's like we were burned when we did some previous product attempts uh, where we tried to create free in the open thing. And then like there was a lot of interest, but then the business model just didn't work out. And like, and, and was similar with Open Atrium was a really good example. Uh, right. Brilliant product, very, very interesting, no business model. I think in, 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 within the same space, DDEV is a, is a very recent example. And I don't know exactly what happened there, but the, the business was shut down. Even though they're open source wise, were very, very successful and most likely will still be. But the business model somehow, like again, this is speculation, I don't know. Um, but there must be a reason why the company shut down. Yeah. So it, it's a very tricky balance. On that side, you see also a shift happening. And it started, I think, with Elastic that was really angry at Amazon um, yes. for using that code base and not contributing back while they actually spend a lot of efforts in building that community. So they went to this fair code uh, or yeah. Yeah, fair code license. And it's an interesting shift. I'm not entirely sure what to think of it, but I, I'm also not thinking that it's wrong to do the fair code license. That said, for now, like we have the same. Some of the stuff that we do is proprietary, but could be hosted on-premise. It's a mm -hmm. license-based thing. Most of the things that we have is open source. Yeah, I think if we we move forward, we will have a mix of fair code and uh, open source, and everything will be open. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting problem space, but for us right now, it's not really an issue. Well, what we saw in the very beginning when we started with the dev portals, we had large enterprise asking, "Okay, so like you know, where's the code?" <laughs> like we have some developers, we've got some Drupal developers. Um, we want to, you know. We want to use your project. And I was like, okay, but like, who's going to be maintaining this? And this is also, I think, what Drupal at some points uh, struggled with is how do you secure enough support for the project? I think that's that's the other thing is like, as, as we grow, how can we give back more to the core project? Like, I think for us as a business, we needed to go away a bit from the Drupal community. Like we needed some distance to be able to to reinvent ourselves, um, because being part of the Drupal community, it was kind of like it's like this echo chamber, and and you you can't differentiate. You're just talking with a bunch of people that are just like you that are trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do, and you're telling them all your best ideas, and they do something very similar, and it's just everybody's moving in the same direction. And there's no specialization and there's no extra value that we're creating through specialization. So it was by creating our own community, like first joining other communities and then creating our own community that we could become very different. And it's that difference that is now creating a lot more value, I think. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. And in that yeah. same way, we also broaden up by adding the, an open source CDP to the mix, yeah. really integrating that well, having a proprietary interface to make it easy and to do the out-of-the-box thing uh, suddenly sets you a bit apart. Drupal itself is not a product. 
Right? Like yeah. we don't productize Drupal on its own. Drupal stays yeah. project based. It's the ecosystem around it and the facilitation and uh, the ease of use of building these customer journeys because it's all integrated. Yeah, that, that's basically what you buy. It's like the way that species diverge. As long as a population is connected, they can't differentiate because they're, there's interbreeding. It's the moment that you can clearly separate, like you put a mountain or like a river in between, <laughs> then there's two populations and they can start diverging and evolving and becoming something else. And then of when that barrier then disappears, if they're sufficiently evolved and they're sufficiently different. Yeah, and then they can connect again. Yeah. They can connect again. And now there's two species living next to each other, actually increasing the, the, the ecosystem services that you have. Biology never really disappeared from you. Huh? No. <laughs> I guess so. um, but basically, this is our job. We build ecosystems. Yeah. We help organizations to understand how to build ecosystems and to get started building ecosystems, be that inside or outside of your organization. And I think that there's some fundamental truths about information flows, differentiation, uh, specialization, uh, competition versus cooperation. Like all of these concepts nature has been doing for billions of years, I think. Yeah. And it's the same thing that we're doing in business. It's not all competition. It's this very careful balance between competition and cooperation. Yeah, and building out ecosystems. I think that's that's a great summary. You really are there in, in a specific cornerstone to, to make sure that they can build out an ecosystem that can grow and evolve instead of being very secret and actually implode. Uh, yeah. That's the, the, that part. And then like what Drop Solid does is indeed, um, it's really great if that's already existing. It's not necessary, but it will really help in speeding up getting to market with such a digital experience platform because it needs to integrate with all of these other APIs or other systems that this enterprise organization has. So if you can combine the two, the organization probably wins or most likely will win because they're faster than the competition and more agile and is able to build a faster ecosystem. And then if you go back to the beginning of this conversation at Walmart versus Amazon, yeah, that's exactly what Amazon did. They built out... Mm -hmm have built out an ecosystem yeah and all their capabilities they've turned into interfaces with new ecosystems so whenever yeah. they have an internal capability that's useful for other people they just turn it inside out and extend the market yeah, and it's and not for everybody yeah so that's i think no. the, the tricky part yeah and it's very great that that you're very ambitious but you have to yeah stay within your boundaries of what's possible and the return on investment of such change yeah why you need to have the markets yeah. power to make something happen. So coming back to the speciation <laughs> yes. metaphor, if you end up on the other side of the river and there's no food for you in your current form, that's it, end of the road. Yeah. Uh, like you can you can go evolve all kind of crazy stuff, but if there's no value for you to capture, it's um, game over. And I think that's that's the other thing is that people are restless. They're looking at these changes that are happening. And organizations are like really worried of being this being disintermediated and uh, or uh, disrupted. And they, so they're like, okay, we also need to do this. So we're going to start an API program. Okay, great. Okay. But sometimes we see, we've seen everybody do this technology. We're also going to do this technology. There's no real plan. Mm. Yeah, and that's the, the buy part. Eh? If, if you go yeah. back, uh, you need to have a plan uh, regardless if you build or buy. Otherwise, you'll make the wrong yes. person. Technology is not the answer. Technology is the leverage. Your work and sweat and insights and differentiation is what is going to actually create the value. But technology can be your leverage. Sometimes technology can help you find new new ideas and you know there's some discovering of value also. And I think that's that's a mistake that sometimes people make is that it becomes just a technology exercise rather than really a strategic thing. Yeah, there's no silver bullet, but it's exactly. a, a, a very fun to work with. Oh, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem, no problem. You're very welcome. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. It's our hope that you're encouraged by today's story and picked up some insights that will help you navigate your digital transformation and make your API program more successful. If you have questions or feedback on the podcast, we invite you to email us at info at 
Thanks for listening.